Banjo-Kazooie is one of those special games that defines a generation. It feels really weird reviewing it in 2020. I don't know about you, but I just wanted a chance to talk about it and share it with the people who missed out. I never owned an N64 as a kid, as my parents were very anti-video game back then. So I mostly experienced Banjo at friends' and neighbors' houses. They never let me play. I didn't have nice friends. But a year or so back, I got the opportunity to play the game myself after all this time of watching from the sidelines. Just a 28-year-old man playing a kid's game lost from his childhood alone in his basement. Nothing pitiful or depraved to see here. Move along. This game looked so amazing as a kid. But is it really a game all about finding and touching things? It's the lost genre of 3D platforming meeting a collectathon. Some newer games like Super Lucky's Tale and Ukulele use the same formula. It's easy to write this off as a Super Mario 64 knockoff, but it honestly feels like its own thing. There's so much more to collect, there's crazy transformations, and the worlds let you stay and explore rather than booting you out after finding each Jiggy, much like Mario Odyssey. You'll collect a handful of Jiggies in each world in order to open up new paths in the overworld to find new levels to explore. In each level, you can also find five Jinjos for a Jiggy and 100 notes for opening extra overworld doors and 100%ing worlds. But there wasn't enough system memory for the game to remember which notes or Jinjos you found, so if you want a high score, you've got to find them all in one run. For the most part, it's not difficult. However, some levels can get so hard they'll crush your hopes of a perfect game entirely. Rusty Bucket Bay. Collecting all the Jiggies is actually quite fun and relaxing. The game gets intense quickly, however, with the final boss, Gruntilda. After collecting enough Jiggies, you'll open the path to face the evil witch head-on, which is pretty unlike the rest of the game up to this point. Sure, there have been many bosses here and there, but nothing this elaborate. I'm gonna say this now. Gruntilda is one of the most breakneck difficult bosses I've ever faced in any video game. The difficulty spike here is laughable. Or at least I hope you'd laugh, because I felt like I was having a brain aneurysm. For the most part, the controls are solid in this game. But against Gruntilda, you'll need to make perfect jumps, dodges, and egg shots in order to even have a chance at winning. It's a long and excruciating battle against the controller and your own sanity. There are so many complicated phases and problematic potential game-ending failure opportunities against Gruntilda, I can't even think of where to begin with them all. But in the end, with enough perseverance and a little bit of luck, you can... Uh, hamster, what are you doing? I give up! You can't just give up! What about perseverance and, and luck? I have neither. What I do have is better things to do than give myself a self-induced combo of migraines and carpal tunnel. You were just one more set of shots into the Ginginator from winning too! There's not enough gold feathers in the world to keep me going. She can have Tootie. Not worth it. Early 3D graphics don't tend to age well, but Rare's fun, cartoony style makes the whole game look and feel alive. Each world has its own set of unique enemies, each fitting the new theme. Plus, all of the Jiggies are creatively hidden in ways that reflect the worlds. There's a lot of thought, time, and effort put into this game. Some worlds look pretty ugly, though, with gross color palettes like Clanker's Cavern and Bubble Gloop Swamp. But others like Mumbo's Mountain, Treasure Trove Cove, and Click Clock Wood are all bright and lively. The real aesthetic of this game in general is just strange. Like 90s cartoon strange. Equal parts quirky and off-putting, but equal parts animated and lovable. You need to turn yourself into a pumpkin in order to climb a mansion and flush yourself down a talking toilet to find a Jiggy hidden in a poop-splattered sewer complete with angry green tentacle monsters. 
The 90s were strange, my friends. You play as Banjo the Bear and Kazooie, his Bregal bird slave, stuffed away in his backpack. They're friends! I think. It's a pretty abusive relationship, but so are all 90s cartoon friendships. The witch Gruntilda kidnaps Banjo's little sister Tootie in order to... extract her prettiness? Or something like that, after finding out that Tootie has the good looks she wants. It's a fairest of them all story. Gruntilda also speaks entirely in rhyme, even when she mocks you throughout the gameplay in the overworld. Oh, man, we missed that opportunity of making an entire video in rhyme. I assure you we don't have time to make this whole video in rhyme. A video must go up this week, but with no rhymes it'll sound bleak. PURPLE ORANGES! <laughs> the sound effects and music of this game might be the most charming part. The talking noises alone are iconic enough to have kinda invented their own silly way of getting around fully voiced video games to come. I love the soundtrack, though. Almost every single track gives the game the perfect feeling it's going for in each world. Don't get ahead of yourself. Some tracks get pretty annoying, but I do agree that the majority are great. I particularly love the themes that get remade based on the situations, kinda like Gruntilda's Lair and Boss Theme and Click Clock Wood and its Four Seasons. Grant Kirkhope is a legend. Anyone else in this game would be lessened. He rhymed! He did it! He did it! I can't believe it, but he did it! There's a good chance if you have an N64, you have already played this charming classic. Is your idea of a fully living world putting eyeballs on everything? This may be one of the most relaxing ways to spend your time on the N64, exploring vibrant worlds and collecting creatively hidden jiggies. Did you grow up in the 90s? The positive gamer in me recognizes the lost genre cast in cartridge with Banjo-Kazooie, giving it a shiny 9 out of 10. It's really hard to develop a good 3D platformer, with the world requiring tons of fine-tuning and spot-on controls to explore it all. But Banjo-Kazooie absolutely nails it. There's a reason people are still talking about this game. The critical gamer in me had some rough patches with Banjo-Kazooie, but is still willing to give it a moderate 6 out of 10. Some jiggies are super easy, whereas others can make you pull your hair out. To 100% the game, you probably need a walkthrough to boot. Plus, that insane difficulty spike at the end does hurt my final impression. It is, however, a stunning achievement all around. But we'd like to hear what you know. Let us know your ratings in the comments below. If you think 3D platformers are outdated and not worth developing anymore, then you're just playing with yourself. But special thanks to Zach for lending me his copy of The Bear and the Bird to play for this video. Also, big thanks to our Patreon members as well. Thank you, Atomic Thomas, Ben, Sid, Denny, Erica, Kai, Patrick, Pyro Joe, Rowan, and Squad Fam. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to like the videos and subscribe for more, and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.